in this, in this new quarter, which is the last quarter, that God Almighty you have graciously given to us after members of this church, Lord, prayed and suggested to us. And Father God, we went and thought through it and prayed. And Father God, you placed this topic in our hearts, Lord. And we don't take it for granted that such a topic has come such a time as this. Father God, you are suffering and you know what will happen even in the future. And Father God, you prepare your people for what will happen. And Father God, we thank you for this prophetic uh, topic, this prophetic theme that you gave to us this year. Father God, we pray that you will continue to use it to hold us to yourself and to help us to hold on to you. That God Almighty, when everything has passed and settled, Lord, we will look back and say, indeed, it is a great God who has been holding our hand. We thank you and we praise you, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday, our Reverend introduced this uh, theme, sub-theme for this last quarter, which is um, guarding the, um, the grip. And today what we will do, because we know these are English words that are communicating some spiritual truth, we still want to understand what is it that we are talking about when we say guarding the grip. And therefore, today's topic is understanding the grip. Um, so we want to just look into that, understanding the grip. So the way I've subdivided my, my sharing is, number one, we are going to look at what that is uh, from the scriptures. Then we will look at threats that threaten the grip. And then we will finish by some motivation to hold on, or rather some motivation uh, to be able to, now that we understand what our grip is, what is the motivation for us as believers to maintain that grip? Uh, one of the easy ways to dis define what our grip is, is you can see the, the picture of where our theme is. There's this gentleman who is leaning on the cross. And there is where the hands are laid on the cross. That is what we could call a grip. Because a grip, according to the English dictionary, says... It is a tight grasp, or to, if you use it as a, as a, as a verb, is to grasp tightly, or a tight grasp, that is a tight hold, that when you are holding the way I'm holding this microphone, and maybe somebody wants to take it from me, there's a way I can tighten my grip on it, which makes it very hard for somebody to pick it away from me. And that is the idea that we are looking into when we talk about um, the grip. So we are praying that this year, even as we come towards the close, that there are some things that we have come to, that have come to, 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 to us, that we have been taught. And um, the Bible teaches that we need to hold on to those things that we have learned. And therefore today we want to look at what is that grip and to help us to look at that grip, we are going to go to First Timothy chapter one verse five. We are going to look at. Let's just uh, start from there, and as we look at it. Now, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Could you go just downwards? Some have deviated and turned aside to fruitless discussion. Now, here, the writer is saying that there were some truths that had been communicated to these people, that are the people in Ephesus. And he is telling um, Timothy about some of the things, and he is saying, don't deviate from these things. So what we are saying is that a grip is a particular kind of... Um, of uh, an emphasis on something that keeps you from deviating from that. And therefore, this is part of it, that, that it helps you not to deviate. It helps you not to drop. If I don't hold this microphone tightly, my grip, if my grip doesn't hold, then it will fall down. And here he's saying that if you begin from there, so because we want to, to we are using, this is an English word, and we are trying to define spiritual realities. So when we say, 
when we are saying um, guarding the grip, what is this grip? We are saying this grip is a hold. This grip is a tight grasp. Now, that is, and, and I'm using a physical thing here, uh, to, uh, a microphone. I'm holding this microphone. But remember, these spiritual realities we are talking about are not physical. And therefore, when we say, for example, hold on, in other words, that is a grip uh, that you are having on a particular truth. What is, it that this, what is this truth that you're having um, a hold on? So what I want to say is this, that the, the, the first, let's go back to five so that we can be able to see that. N um, now, this, our instruction is love from a pure heart. Now, that is the heart. In other words, when the Bible mostly talks about the heart, it talks about the emotions. It is talking about, sometimes talks about the thoughts together with the emotions, together with attitudes. So here we are saying that the kind of a hold you are supposed to have is a hold of your emotions. Your emotions should hold on to something. And what is this that we are holding on to? Of course, the topic here is very clear. That is the theme that we say holding on to Christ. But there is quite a number of truths around Christ that we need to hold on to. So we are saying, what is it? We are saying your emotions must, must immerse themselves into something and hold it. That is the emotions. That is the pure heart. May your emotions hold on to something. Now, the other part is the conscience. These are some truths that come, and the conscience of your heart or of your spirit is supposed to hold on to this. And then we say, a sincere faith. How do you do it? It is by faith. And, you know, we're going to, to, to be able to look into that. But we want to say that when we are saying that, when we are talking about a grip, it's not a physical thing we are talking about. We are talking about a spiritual reality. And we are saying that this truth that the scripture are teaching here, that we're going to be seeing uh, uh, shortly, that we're supposed to hold, these things we must hold on to them. Now, let me still to understand that, let's look at the parable of the sower, because there's a place where it talks about a plant that did not have roots, and the roots were not able to hold onto the soil, and that is still the same. So let's go to Mark chapter 4, verse, should be verse 3, Mark chapter 4, verse, should be 3. Let's consider the sower who went out to sow, and then continue downwards. He sowed to cut some fell on the path, and the birds ate them up. And then other fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. And it sprang up right away, since it didn't have deep soil. In other words, the roots were not able to hold. That is the same idea. That is, a grip. they were not able to have a grip on the soil. And therefore, there was a problem. So this is a, a parable that is given to explain a spiritual reality. And the spiritual reality we are saying is, uh, the spiritual reality we are saying, it is um, your emotions. And by the, uh, there's a time I, when I do discipleship, I keep telling my students that one of the most undiscipled part of a human, a Christian, is the emotions. Sometimes we can disciple the mind, and the mind knows a lot of truth. But you find that our emotions have not been discipled. Our emotions are still, can still run wild. And sometimes we think our emotions cannot be held. You see, you know, that is what I'm feeling, and what can I do about my feelings? And sometimes we think we cannot do anything about our feelings. And yet, our feelings are the most important part of a, of a Christian. Because if our emotions have not been, um, have not been discipled, they, can, they are not holding a family to the truth of God, then there is a problem. And remember here, yeah, the Bible is saying that the word of God came, the, the seed came, it fell on the ground, and what happened is that there was a very shallow, it was very shallow, the soil. And therefore, they, their roots did not have a, a, um, a grip. They didn't hold. And maybe even again to see that, we are still looking at the word grip and trying to understand it. Let's go lastly to Luke chapter 6, the last verses of Luke chapter 6. And we see again um, Jesus trying to explain this grip, this holding. What do we mean by this grip? What do we mean by... Uh, you know, just holding into these truths. Could we go there? Last verses of uh, Luke chapter 6. Okay. 
Thank you very much uh, for going there. I'm also there. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet you do not what I say? I will show you what it's like who, uh, one who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug deep. Now, verse 48, look at verse 48. Just go to verse 48 and look at it again. And just to understand what a grip would actually mean, um, it says, um, he dug deep and laid foundation on rock. He dug deep. Like a man building a house who dug deep. That word there, dug deep. Why did he dig deep? So that the plant, the roots can have a grip and hold onto the soil. And uh, rather hold onto the, uh, in other words, the, um, the building, sorry. The building here he is giving an example of a building, not a plant now. And in that building, he is saying you dig deep on the foundation, on the rock, so that when you dig deep, then the rock can be, uh, the, the stones that you are using to build, or whatever it is you are using to build, can be held by the ground. In other words, it is very possible that somebody can be in Christ, but because you have not dug deep, it is very possible that you can experience a lot of challenges. And you can be unable to progress as a Christian. And I want to say that I think one of the greatest reasons I have seen today for a lack of um, uh, excellence in our Christian work is lack of depth in Christ. It is just so, you know, it is just so alarming, brethren, that you find somebody saying, the other day I remember we were asking somebody, are you born again? And then there were things saying, I think I might be born again. You know, can you imagine? Say, what makes you think you might be born again? I think there's a time I said the sinner's prayer. I can't remember that here. But, but I think chances are that I might be born again. And therefore we were trying to talk to them. And, but the point is that there is a, a great disaster, brethren, of lack of depth in the things of God. Of lack of depth. Brethren are not having de depth in the Lord. People in families are not having depth in the Lord. You find somebody saying, I'm, I'm, I'm also a Christian. I'm also a Christian. Okay, I go to church. Some I don't go to church. But, you know, I, I, but there's lack of depth in the Lord Jesus Christ. And may God help us. When the Bible is talking about grip holding family, it's talking about establishing a grip. Now, what are these things that we are supposed to really establish our grip around? I just want to mention a few things that... Uh, our intercessor, Nelly, mentioned very quickly. Let's go to Ephesians. Look at some of these things that are so deep that we need to hold on as Christians, that we need to establish a grip. Our emotions need to establish a grip around these truths. Ephesians chapter 1, verse, from verse 16. We, because there's lack of depth. There's lack of depth. Um, stop. Um, I never stop giving thanks. Is that remember, uh, as for you, as I remember you in my prayers, go, um, verse 17, that God, our Lord Jesus, the glory of Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, knowing God, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints. Just getting to understand God in a deep way. There's lack of understanding of God in a deep way. There's lack of understanding who God is in his character and even in his goodness. There's a lot of lack of that among Christians. When the Bible talks about us having a grip, is that we need to understand God as our father. Who is God as our father? What does it mean to have God as a father? What does it mean to have God as Lord? What is, does it mean to have a sovereign God as your God? What does it really mean? When the Bible says in, in Isaiah 41 verse 10, do not be dismayed for I am your God. Do not fear for I am with you. Now, do you really understand what that means? Go, to have God on your side. Because if you do not, then you will fear. Then you will be dismayed. Because you know, we need to understand God in a deeper way. We need to understand God. Who is this God? So that when, because storms will come, I promise you. Storms will come. I wish, uh, uh, you know, 
But they will come. I wish they would not come. You know, uh, but they will come. You know, I, I stay there and I tell my wife, <coughs> oh, sorry. I wasn't planning to say this, but now that I've started, <laughs> we finish. No, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, you know, my, both my parents are, are not, are no more, they, they, they passed on. So tell my wife that our parents, both of them are alive. So let's just really visit these parents so much. Let, let's do whatever we can and really visit them. I look at her and I know she doesn't know what it means for your parent to die. But, you know, um, I keep praying and that we may know God so that when that time comes, because it can, it can crash, it can crash, mm -hmm. it can crash, I'm telling you the truth. Um, now. So let's continue with <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, please, <laughs> brethren. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. We are there? Um, yes, it, it, can, it, it comes. And yes, please, yes. Yeah. Eyes of your heart. Let's go to verse 19. Riches. Do we understand the riches that we have in this God? The immeasurable greatness of his power. Just understanding God, how God is so powerful in us. The great power that he has towards us. Brethren, if you could just grasp that. If, a, if you find a brother and a sister who grasps those truths in their totality and their, in their, their depths, I'm telling you, you will find a strong Christian. You will find a Christian that, that, that is going to stand in these days and encourage others in these days. Because we are living in perilous times. The Bible says in the last days there will be perilous times. There will be terrible times. Are we ready for terrible times? Because we need to know God. We need to know the riches. We need to know. So we need to know God, number one. Number two, we have seen, we need to know the riches of his inheritance. How rich it is to, 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 to how the riches of God are towards us. That we have been adopted to be sons of God. Do you know what that means? Do you know what it means to be a child of God? Or are we just talking about it? Because we need to understand that. That it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Abakuk had, had a conversation with God. Towards the end of Abakuk, he said, towards the end, that even if the, the, the whatever, what are they? Fig trees. Even if, you know, for you to reach there, you really have to have known God. Can you imagine reaching a stage where you're saying, even if fig trees will not bear fruit, even if the cattle will not be in, the, in their stall, even if uh, there will be no salt. Can you imagine saying, even if I never get a job, I am not going to come out of this God. Can you imagine saying that? That even if I don't get a child and I'm married, I am not going to come out of this God because I have understood Three things. Number one, he is a good God. Number two, there is great riches in him. Number three, there is great power towards me because I believe. And I will not leave this God. That is the kind of a grasp and the kind of a grip that is our prayer as your pastorate. That this church, can we have such kind of brethren who are not knocked down by, 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 um, by a delayed salary? Who are not knocked down? Who are not knocked down by a delayed marriage? Who are not knocked down? By a, by, by, a, by a parent who has died and by a child who is sick. Can we have these people who know God so much and so well that we are not going to be moved? Because we, we know who I, I know who I have believed. And I know he is faithful. Like the way Job said that even if he slays me, yet I will believe in him. Can we have such kind of understanding and knowing God that that is the kind of, that is the grip we are talking about. And that is the major grip, but there are many other grips that we need to hold on to. But that is the major grip of getting to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is this gospel that has brought to us this great, great and good God? And that we are willing, like Paul said, you know, Paul said something very scaring. Until the, he was being, people were pleading with him. The elders of Ephesus were pleading with Paul. And Paul told them, you're saying I'm, when I go to Jerusalem I will be arrested. By the way, I'm even ready to die. And you know when you reach there, people now leave you. By the way, when you say you're ready to die, people now leave you because there is no any other thing after that. I remember there was a
parent who was being told, their child was very sick and they were being told to take them to a witch doctor and a, a wizard, you know. You, and I remember that person said that they were being told by the clan that, do you know this child will die? Now, the moment the, the clan stopped pers pestering our friend is when he said, in fact, I am ready to bury my child. I'm ready to bury my child. I'm not going to go to, to a witch doctor. I'm ready to bury my child. They said, this, this guy is mad. Let's leave him alone. Paul said that I am even ready to die. Can we have such kind of believers that are ready to die to do the right thing? That I'm not bribed. I'm ready to stay jobless. I'm ready to die. You guys come for my burial. I'm ready for that. But I want to stand for God. That is the kind of a grip that I am praying personally that God would help me. That I would be so much ready to do the right thing and to help and to, to be there for, um, and may God, may God, may God help us. May God help us, brethren. May we have a deep, did we finish that? The, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? You know, you might not be walking around and doing miracles, but God has great power towards you. There's great power towards you. You know, there is a servant of God who died of a sickness. I don't know whether you know that servant. I, he keeps surprising me. He healed so many people and yet he died of a disease. You know that man? He was called Elisha. Can you, you know, I read those scriptures and I keep reading them. You know, how can you heal people and die of a sickness? It just doesn't make sense. He did actually did more miracles than Elijah. And they died of a sickness. But the problem, the challenge is, when he died, there was a time another, you know, guys were going to bury a dead man. And some, some attackers were coming, so they threw the man into an empty grave. But the bones of Elisha were there. So when this man touched the bones of Elisha, the man rose and ran together with them. <laughs> Can you imagine? And this servant of God, Elisha, had died of a sickness, and yet his bones could heal. You know, how do you explain that? How do you explain that? I remember one time we were praying somewhere, and and the person we were praying for got better, but got worse later. And the people were saying, do you, people, do you have the power of God with you? I said, yes, we have the power of God with us. And how come you cannot heal this person? I said, I don't know, but I know we have the power of God with us. If Elijah had the power of God and he died of a sickness, and his bones could heal, then I believe every believer in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter who you are. There's great power of God towards you. Don't doubt that. The power to sustain you in your faith, like the three Hebrew boys who said, you guys, we are ready to go to that fire. We are ready to go to that fire. May God help us to have that grip. Now, we were just looking at a grip. Let's look at, I just want us to look at three, well, maybe we can look at two major threats to the grip. Uh, and one of them is, one of the greatest uh, danger to our grip, grip is lack of depth. We, we, are not, we, we are not cultivating. You know, whenever I was preparing, I was like I was saying, I wanted to say the, the greatest is suffering. I discovered it's not suffering. It's not suffering. The greatest threat to our hold is not suffering. Actually, some of the people who have held so strongly to God are people who have suffered the most. Just go and read the Bible. People who have suffered the most are people who have held strongly to God, meaning the greatest threat to your grip on God is not suffering. It's something else. I keep saying that the greatest threat is not even temptation. It's not even temptation. Because those are the other two that I am to talk about. The greatest threat is that we are not cultivating a depth in God. And we need to do that. We need to do that. We need to study the scripture, holding a pen and praying, God, let me understand what scriptures are saying. Let me understand why people are ready to die for you in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let me understand why uh, Stephen is ready to die for you. Let me understand why Moses was ready to be sent away and um, he, he was almost becoming a pharaoh. And he was ready to be sent away to suffer with the children of Israel. Let me understand it, not just with my mind, with my heart and with my emotions. Let me understand why Paul was ready to go to Jerusalem, not just to be arrested, but he was even ready to die. And the way I fear death. God, help me to understand it. Help me to have a grip around it. Help me to, 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 to deepen. Because remember... That seed that it dried, it's because it did not, didn't have a grip on the soil. 
that house that, that, that um, was crushed is not because there was no rock. It's not because there was no Christ. It's because it had not, the, the builder had not dug deep into that rock. Have you dug deep into that rock? Have you dug deep into Christ? Yes, I know you are in Christ. I, I know you come to church. But have you dug deep into Jesus Christ? Have you dug deep into the scriptures? So that you can really understand, God help me to know why people are ready to die for you and yet I am not. Tell me, uh, help me to know why people would be willing to suffer for Russia's sake and yet me I'm afraid. Help me, help me. Let me we cultivate a grip around this. God, I will not leave this place until I establish a strong grip into you. So I can be ready to live for you no matter what, come, not, no matter what happens. May God help us to do that. May we study the scriptures with a pain, with, with, with great devotion. Let's, let me read for you a scripture which says that. First Timothy chapter, um, is it four? Um, first Timothy. Um, let's just look at that. May God help me. May God help me. Why are people ready to die for the gospel? And me, I'm not. And I'm yet I'm a Christian. Um, it's there. Um, that is First Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself fully to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Be conscientious about yourself and your teaching. You know, persevere in these things. When you read up there, he is being told about the things that he's supposed to be doing. And one of them is the public reading of scripture and quite a number of other things. May God help us. Give yourself wholly to them. Where is that part which says that give yourself wholly to them? Verse 15. Let's go to verse 15. May God help us to do that. May we deepen our roots in Christ. The Bible says somewhere in the book of Proverbs, if you flatter in the day of battle, if you are defeated in the day of battle, who can finish that scripture for me? If you are defeated in the day, day of the battle, what is the problem? According to the Bible, it's because your strength is small. It's not because your enemy is stronger. You know, by the way, that is a very revolutionist verse. I will get it for you. I had not uh, thought I would, so I, I, I may not know where it is for now. But it says that if you fail in the day of battle, okay, if you fail, and if I fail, if I fail into a temptation, it's not because the temptation was stronger. It's because I was weaker. And then I can be able to work on myself. I can be able to give myself to this thing that the Bible says that we give ourselves into. May God help us that we are not going to be blaming everyone else and everything else and not ourselves. May God help us. May God help us that we can be willing to, uh, to deepen our, our threat. So we are saying that the great, greatest threat is that we are not giving ourselves wholly. You know the, the ants, you know the ants, they gather, ga ants gather food in the summer, okay? Not during rains, they, they understand. You must gather your strength during summer. Don't wait until you, you are losing a very close relative for you to find strength. Get the strength now. Get the strength now. Let us not wait for a challenge to come. Then we can see how we will be strong. Get the strength now. Let us be prepared for hard times. Let us be prepared for hard times. Are we ready? You know, persecution is there in Kenya, but there is a persecution that is in, um, in Arab countries where people actually lose their lives. Are we in Kenya ready for that? If we are defeated by a bribe, because in Kenya the greatest persecution is bribes. If we are defeated by bribes, what about... When somebody will come with a gun, let us get ready now. Praise the Lord. The goodness with having a lot of strength, there's no problem even if no challenge comes. It's still your strength. But the problem is that to go around without strength in Christ and then challenges come, we will have a great trouble. Let's go to the second one. The, greatest, the, the second one is, um, and we're going to be reading that, is the, the, the other big uh, threat to our grip is the devil and, of course, and sin. Let's read a, a second, um, second Timothy, and we see that threat that, that is posed by evil. The threat that is posed by evil. Mm. You're there? Second um, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 25. And we see that. Um, mm -hmm. There's a place in the Bible which says that, Resist. Instructing his opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance to know the truth. Let's go to 26. Then they may come to their senses and escape the devil's trap, having captured, been captured to, he, to do his will. So there is the threat of evil and of the devil. 
And still, I still insist, the Bible says that, that they may come to their senses. You, you still find that even when the threat is evil, the, the greatest deterrent to that is our coming to our senses. And that we can be able to resist the evil. We can be able to resist sin, temptation. That is what threatens our grip. Because sin tempts us to release our grip on the Lord and to release our grip on the truth that we know. That the Bible says do not lie, and we need to hold on to that. But the Bible says this is not lying, it's just a small lie to be able to escape. And therefore you can release your grip on what you know to be true, that I want to speak the truth in love. But then you can be tempted that, that if you do not hold on to this, then there can be some escape for you. So I want to say that is our second threat. May God help us to be able to do that. The Bible says that resist the devil and they will flee from you. But how do we resist the devil unless you already understand these things that we are talking about? How he could come and how Christ, remember those three things in Ephesians. Don't forget, knowing God and knowing the riches that we have in God and the power that we have in God. When we have those things, we can be able to, to, to face our enemy and say, devil, you know what? I know my God. You know what? I will speak the truth. It doesn't matter if it gets me into trouble because I know God will take me out of the trouble. But even if he doesn't, I will not do that. May God help us. So let's look at the, the last one is suffering. Suffering, um, suffering, brethren, um, when it comes, and we, won, we didn't have the depth that we had. Let's look at uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we see the kind of suffering that came to these people. Brethren, suffering. Many people have rejected the gospel because of suffering, because they ask, how can a, a good God allow suffering to come? And we need to understand, why does God allow suffering to come? Quite a number of Christians reach this level and give up on Christ. They say, if it is like that, yeah, I'm not there. Are we there? Uh, Second Corinthians chapter 4. And, um, sorry, Second Corinthians mm, chapter 4. See people that really suffered. And, um, yeah, we are there says that, uh, let me begin from verse 7, says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And then verse 8 says, we are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Christ may also be revealed in our body. For we are alive, are, who are alive are always being given over to, death, over to death for Christ's sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in Christ. What I would want to say, uh, the way I would I put it is this. Uh, it's not necessarily that suffering is the greatest threat to our grip. I, w I tend to think that and to understand that our greatest threat in, when it comes to suffering is us not understanding what God is doing by allowing suffering to be there in the world. Or rather, why suffering exists in the world, and especially to us. I don't know whether you've ever heard, when we go through suffering, we keep asking, why, why me? God, there are so many people who are even evil more than I am. I remember reading somewhere on, uh, on um, Facebook a few weeks ago of a lady who is going through a very painful suffering with, 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 uh, with cancer, and the lady, um, the people who are writing there were saying, the lady screams and keeps saying, God, why are you doing this to me? What sin did I commit, and why can't you forgive me even if I committed a sin? Why are you allowing this suffering to come to me? And then the lady was saying, please, people, help me because God is, has failed to help me. So he was calling upon people to come and help, and, and, and she's a believer, and I was thinking that that most of the times when, we, when suffering hits us, brethren, we lose our senses most of the time. I'm telling you the truth. That when suffering comes to us, we lose our senses most of the time. And if we have not de de deepened our knowledge of God and riches of being in God and the power of being in God, if they are not so much saturated in our hearts so that when you squeeze us, it is that which comes out and not bitterness, then it becomes a big challenge because it is very hard to talk to somebody like that. Because when you ask me like that, me, I will not answer you. I will just say that 
me, I don't know why you're suffering, but I, what I know is that our Savior suffered on the cross. That's what I know. And if you ask me, I don't know why God allowed Jesus to suffer on the cross, and yet he has the power to save without Jesus having to die. I don't know. Jesus, by the way, God has power to save without Jesus having to die. But yet God chose Jesus to, to die and to suffer and to be abused to save us. I think that should surprise us more than our own suffering. Why would God allow his son to suffer? You think you can allow your child to suffer so that he can save other people. Why did God do that? But when you read here, let me just read it for you. Uh, one of the studies I've been doing to understand suffering, and I could recommend this to you, you could go and study the book of 2 Corinthians. It talks so much about suffering from chapter 1 to the last chapter. Actually, it's about suffering. And it gives quite a number of still collecting the reasons God gives for suffering. And uh, so far there are seven, but I think there are more. One of them in chapter 1 talks about God, our Father of all comfort. You know that. So um, somebody said, that why does God come to comfort us? Why didn't, he stop, why didn't he stop the suffering? But I think that's unfair. I think that's unfair because the Bible says God is our comforter. Why are you not willing to receive God as a comforter? Why are you accusing him of delaying until suffering happened? And remember, we have said Jesus died on the cross. And that makes the difference, brethren. That makes the difference. If God allows his son to die for us and suffer for us, brethren, we can, we can hold on to Christ even through suffering. We can, brethren. I, I know when we go through suffering, I, I know we lose senses. I did, and I have done quite a number of times. And I know in future, I, I, I will also lose my sense. But, but when you have a strong grip in God, you will not totally get lost. Yeah, you will like, I remember when my mom died and I was like, God, I, I, think, I think God, me, I'm not engaging with you. Let me engage here because I don't know what you are doing. But somehow God was able to find me in that confusion. But I was just saying, let us deepen our grip on God during summer like the ants. Let us receive a lot of strength. Let us engage with the preachings. And they are very good preaching. Today you can really access so many preaching on the internet. Brethren, some books that you just dream of having, they are there. But as we are busy running up and down and we are not depending on our roots on Christ. Okay, I have to finish and say... That, so I'm, I'm saying that that is our greatest threat, that, or not our greatest, it's one of the threats that if, especially if suffering comes and we have a bad attitude towards it, go and study this, may God help us. Why does God allow suffering to come? Brethren, if you want me to ask, answer in a philosophical way, we can answer, okay? But I know it will not help you. What I know is that Christ suffered and he promises, he promises that he will be with us in trouble. I don't, do you know that scripture in Psalm 91? You know, we, we, Psalm 91 talks, God rescues from suffering, God rescues. But there's a place where he says, he will be with us in trouble. Oh my God, be with us in trouble. Amen. Be with us in trouble. Oh my God. False teachers, that is the last one. False teachers is a threat. First Peter chapter 4, there's also the whole idea of a false, false teachers. And especially when suffering is there, there, there are so many false teachers who will come and tell you so many things that, that uh, you know, there's an easy way you can come out of your suffering, by the way. There's an easy way. There's an easy way. And there have come so many people who are praying for people to bring them out of suffering and charging fee. And most of them, actually, they're acting like sorcerers. But they are there and they, they are very much in the market. And they are even advertising very openly that, do you have a problem in this? Do you have a problem in this? Do you have a problem in this? Call this number. <laughs> and some believers are even calling them. <laughs> I remember one of them was called and he was being told, which church do you go? He said the church. said, and how come the church has not helped you to, to overcome that problem? Come here. And then they are, they are, they are given some rules when you, they go there. That when you are going home, don't look backwards. Don't do, and, and, and you're like, what kind of, of prayer is this? <laughs> and people are going there. That if you don't have a job, if you are childless and you want a child, come here, call this number. May God help us not to fall into false teachers' hands. Because there are so many. Of course, others go to the other extreme and they say, feel nothing and, you know, do what? They say, me, I feel nothing. Others go to the other extreme. Say, me, I'm immune. Me, I don't now care. And that's another false teaching. May God help us to gain a grip into him. Let's go to the last bit and just say that our greatest motivation, I just want to read two verses. One of them is God's, God promises us his presence. And let's read that verse in um, Hebrews chapter, chapter 13, verse 5 and 6. That God, God, may God presence. Oh, my God. May, we really need that. Are we there? Oh my God, may he strengthen this grip. 
because most of the time I'm telling the truth, you feel like you can't hold anymore. But God promises that he will strengthen that grip. Your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You know, that, that is the, some theologians actually agree that this is the greatest promise that God makes for believers. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You know, God can say, I will send something. God can give you something. But can you imagine God not giving you something, but giving you himself? That me, I am giving you myself. Don't fear even if you do not have money. You know, sometimes when I don't have money and I'm so much scared and I'm confused and I'm running up and down, and then I remember this verse, say, oh God, I wish I could hold on to this verse. But for now, I think I have to worry, God. <laughs> Honestly, let me worry because I don't have the money. And, and these apps, these apps on me, I really don't like them. These apps that whereby even people are changing their phone numbers because I've really borrowed and... and Oh my God, brethren. Are you sure, God, you mean this? And he's not saying I will give you money. He's saying I will give you myself. You know, I, God, honestly. Can you pay rent using God, brethren? Can you pay rent? <laughs> I want to pay rent, God. Be realistic, God. I want money, pay rent. And you are saying that you never leave me. I, I need money, God. And even you, you know that. Can you imagine going to landlord and say, have you come to pay? Yes. What are you paying? God, I've come with God and I'm paying. You no. Know, be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said he will never leave you. Therefore, and then it even continues. Therefore, we may we may boldly say, can, can you imagine boldly saying that? That the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can my landlord do to me? You know, no, no. Oh my God. Brethren, brethren. You people, have you ever suffered? Have you ever lacked money? <laughs> you know, some people look so good. And, but God is faithful, brethren. God is going to help us. This is what will strengthen our grip on Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. But it's not easy. I'm saying that. I, I know. I, I've, I've gone through that, and I will continue going through that. And I know <laughs> God will be together with me. Oh, God. Because God, honestly, look at the clock. This clock. God... Time, time, God. Time. <laughs> time. You know. But he's just saying that you will be with me. God, honestly, I need something that I can touch like this. Say, you can touch me. No, no, God. <laughs> Understand what I'm saying. That is number one. And then the last one as we finish is God has made a very powerful promise. This promise, brethren, is a great one. Let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, and when we are going to end around there. May God help us with this kind of a promise that God has made. He said, for we sympathize with the prisoners and accepted with joy the confession of your possessions, knowing that you yourself have a better and enduring possession. You know, that kind of a promise that even after now, I have a, can you imagine a better, is a better in what? More enduring possession. That even after this, because these people were really sacrificing to serve others, but they, they were beginning to stop sacrificing because they were not assured of the future very well. You know, when you are very much assured of the future, brethren, this life is not the end. I'm telling you the truth. The real life is coming. I'm not saying that we, cannot, we can treat this, this life with, without seriousness. No. Actually, we should treat it with a lot of seriousness because it, it, it takes us to the other one. And the way we live here will also influence the other one. But what I want to say, brethren, there is a promise that there is better and more enduring possessions. And that is why we can give whatever we have even when we don't have enough. Because we know. You know, if you don't know, you can, ima if somebody, you can imagine if somebody has won the lottery and uh, several millions and you are borrowing them like 10 shillings. You know they'll give you and even a hundred because they know, they know that whatever they are going to get is better and more enduring. Brethren, we can hold our grip because it doesn't matter. Even if like the three Hebrew boys, they knew that even if he doesn't deliver us, he will deliver us. Every believer in Christ Jesus gets delivered. Every believer in Jesus Christ gets healed ultimately. Because when you get there, in that place where it's better and more enduring than nothing, nothing. In fact, the Bible says that this momentary troubles we are going through are preparing an a weight of glory that far outweighs all of them. That is Second, Peter, Second Corinthians chapter four, verse seventeen. May we hold on to that. Let us pray.
our Father and our God. Father God, we would want to strengthen this grip, but you know, God, that most of the times we are not able to do it. But you promise your presence. You promise that you are together with us. You promise us a better future. And you say that even now you are together with us. You are giving yourself to us to help us to strengthen this grip, Lord. I pray, Lord, for this church and members of this church. May we deepen our grip. Those who are listening online, God, may we deepen our grip. Not just jumping over scriptures. Not just jumping over services. Just jumping over prayers. Deepening our root. We understand what it really means to be born again. And what it means to know God. What it means to experience the riches of the inheritance that we have inherited in Christ. To experience the power that is in God that he has towards us. May we be able to hold strongly to this, God Almighty, so that we will be able to stand in that day of trouble. And we will be able to encourage others with the same encouragement that you have given to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can, take our, we can stand as we share the final words. Yeah, you can share after this. Just get a friend and share with them, uh, even as you encourage one another. Uh, Father, we thank you even uh, for this coming week. As we go to this coming week, Lord, be with us. Those who do not have jobs, God, again, we pray for them. Father God, we pray that you will open doors for those of us who do not have jobs. Those who do business, God, open up their businesses, Lord. Father God, those who are in, in school, Father God, provide opportunities for us to continue learning and to continue, Lord, experiencing. We pray, Lord, for those who are staying at home, the moms who are staying with their children. Father God, continue to encourage them and strengthen them, Lord. God, we pray for missionaries who are trusting you in the field and preaching the word of God. Father God, continue to empower and strengthen them. Be together with us and cover us with your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Now may the grace 